The following video is not heavily edited. Why? Because I'm a lazy, trifling ass bitch, that's why. So I do apologize for any clusterfuck or mess that usually is edited out. I truly didn't have the energy. Hope you enjoy. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey, hi, hello. Welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and please ignore any mess that you can see or this setup. Um, yeah, it's cloudy today, so I have my light on. I am going to film this. Um, you're gonna see my screen for most of the time and I'll be probably in the corner or may pop in, but we are here to talk about book community, where I try to keep you abreast of the shenanigans in the bookish community. Um, it's obviously January, so this is really a wrap up of December, but also um, a couple of things from January or some updates that I just looked up for things um, that did start in December or things that just happened. So we have much to go through. I have organized it into some sections and I wrote it down. So we'll start out with the hot goss, just like quick little topics or quick little updates that don't have like much to say, but are worth noting. And then we have some cyclical topics. So things that we continue to talk about that came back up again, that I'll just talk about for a moment. And then on to the bigger things and not saying like they're more important than something else, just there is more to go through. I haven't talked about it before or there's you know more information about it to share. As always, I'll have any links um, to things that I have on the screen listed down below. So I was paying for a subscription in New York Times and <laughs> And then I saw that I could read these articles without paying that $4 a month. And so I have a Mac. So on Safari, you can just put your browser into reader view and read the New York Times articles because some of those will be listed down below. And can I side note that it is very annoying in the year of our Lord 2022 that these companies make it so hard to unsubscribe. So I subscribed to New York Times and it was being drafted every month for my PayPal account. But then when I went to unsubscribe, they're like, oh, you have to call this number and do this. And it's this number in the United States and I have an Italian phone number and all this. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And so you know what I did? I canceled the subscription payment on my PayPal. And then they tried to renew and they're like, something's wrong with your payment. And I'm like, ain't nothing goddamn wrong with my payment, boo-boo. You ain't getting my four dollars no more. So anyway, all those links will be down below as always. But you know, before we start, how about you hit that like button? I would appreciate it. You should subscribe. Um, and yeah, so let's get into it. We got, we have much to cover. Wait, before we get into it though, I have to give a shout out to the sponsor of this video, which is Surfshark. I have talked about Surfshark for a while and that's because I love them. I use them. I have used them the entire time I've lived over here in Italy. Whenever we leave, I will continue to use them because they're amazing. They're a virtual private network or a VPN and they are so affordable. It kind of doesn't make sense how cheap it is, but don't think about that. Just purchase it. So virtual private networks, the main reason I got one honestly was to watch my favorite shows because I'm obviously my IP address is registering in Italy and I wanted to use Italian Netflix. I wanted HBO Max. Okay. I wanted to watch The Nanny. Disney Plus, Hulu, okay? And of course, I'm not gonna lie, that's my most, my top reason for having it, but it does so much other amazing things like keep your information secure on your own internet at home, and especially when you're out in public on that public Wi-Fi, those things can be sketchy. It really opens you up to um, some danger so it can protect you then. And because you're an amazing subscriber of mine, if you use my code, which is Owens, O-W-E-N-S, let me tell you something you get 83% off and three months free. Just do it. I mean, honestly, it, <laughs> it's ridiculous. 83% off for three months free? Yes, with my code, Owens. O-W-E-N-S. Um, of course, that will be linked down below in the description and in the comments, so check them out. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring this video, but let's get into the mess. There's so much. Okay, so we're gonna start with our hot goss. Again, just a rundown of some topics here. And uh, so for our first, oh wait, did I put them out of order? Don't be looking at my, don't, don't look at the screen y'all. Oh my God, it's out of order. Oh no. Oh my God, hold on. Okay, <laughs> okay. So I did a video a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Honestly, I don't remember, but 
um, obviously one of the big five publishers, Penguin Random House, is trying to purchase Simon & Schuster for like two billion dollars in cash, which is ridiculous, and would take us from five major publishers down to four. And we don't need that. So the Department of Justice, the United Depart the United States Department of Justice has filed a lawsuit. And I did a video, I'll link that below, that had whatever information was available at that time. But now a date has been set for the trial, which will be August 1st, which is far away, but I'm sure it'll fly by because what is time? But their lawsuit is to block this merger. Um, they were basically citing, is it like antitrust laws again? All that information's in that video and there were some really great comments of people who are in law or like had more information that they shared down below the video so so it said the key dates they have um until april 15th to have their discovery finished and then experts so i guess if each side is calling an expert has to be finished by june june 21st pre-trial briefs july 15th and then pre-trial conference july 25th the trial is set to start august 1st so any other information that comes up i am keeping a close watch on this because i really need the department of justice to win we do not need penguin to penguin random house to be able to buy simon and schuster it just there's so many reasons why it's bad again the video will be linked please go watch it if you have any more questions but i'll keep you guys updated on that as more information comes out and then Okay, so if you watched any of my nonfiction videos, I talked about the book I read by Patrick, Patrick Radden Keith called Empire of Pain. And it's about this raggedy family here, the Sackler family, who own Purdue Pharma, which is a pharmaceutical company, who are the creators of Oxycontin, which is basically one of the huge drivers of the current opioid crisis we have in America. And one of the big things when they created this drug was they really lied and tried to silence anyone that said this drug was not addictive that was the whole thing this is the new wave of pain medication they wanted everyone to take it it's not addictive it's addictive so anywho spoiler alert end of the book i was so pissed because they even though people had brought lawsuits against them they always had enough money and power to like either pay it off or you know a loophole get around the rules and then they had basically their the last thing that was brought against them they're like okay if we plead guilty which they plead pled guilty um it was the company none of the people none of the sackler family members none of the people who actually worked there were in trouble it was the corporation um it basically like banned for future lawsuits against them but but a new judge says that they um let's see so this judge colleen mcmahon of the u.s district court for the southern district of new york said that the settlement part of a restructuring plan for purdue approved in september by a bankruptcy judge should not go forward because it releases the company's owners members of the billionaire sackler family from liability in civil opioid related cases so um if this was whenever this was because it said thursday evening okay end of december just so december 16th um she went through a painstakingly negotiated settlement between Purdue Pharma and, a th and thousands of state, local, and tribal governments that sued the maker of the prescription painkiller OxyContin for the company's role in the opi opioid epidemic, saying that the plan was flawed in one critical area. So they basically were siphoning money out of their company and putting it away so they had money. And so when all these losses came, came against them, they were like, oh, we don't have all that money, but you can have this little bit of money. We're filing bankruptcy. And then within this thing, they were basically like taken off the like going forward. No one was going to be able to sue them in cases like civil cases like this. And now this judge has said, ha <laughs> ha no and i'm so happy because again it was their company they got they had their millions and they're living great and they need to pay and so i can't wait i hope people sue these motherfuckers into the poorhouse fuck all of them fuck all of them i hope they go broke so any more news on that i'll keep you updated because <sighs> there is hope thank you jesus all right moving on I know you didn't see this little thing right here bam read review bitch I'm not paying for that so former governor and disgusting fuck boy Andrew Cuomo had a memoir right so he had a coronavirus pandemic memoir I didn't even know that but uh yeah he earned five million and now the ethics board of New York State is like give us that money back you son of a bitch so this is that a new 
God damn it, why did I do that? A New York State's ethics board ordered former governor Andrew M. Cuomo on Tuesday to turn over millions of dollars in profits from his coronavirus pandemic memoir, giving him 30 days to comply. This came out December 14th, so I mean, homie, you don't have that much time left. The extraordinary directive is the latest development of fall from grace for the former governor, who in the span of just four months lost his job and reputation, and who is now facing a criminal trial after being accused of groping an aide in the executive mansion. Fuck you, Andrew. Aha, you're broke and disgraced. Give that money back, homie. Disgusting. I hate it. Thank you, goodbye. Uh, Cause, okay. This says he he received authorization to write the book under false pretenses the board had previously ruled. Um, I didn't look I I guess I should look more into it. I saw something briefly about the thing with the book but like I didn't want to look more into it because I knew this man was an asshole so like I'll look it up and leave a link down below so you can have all the facts I guess you know you need factual evidence okay fine i did the research for you so he originally had received approval from the joint commission on public ethics to write this book but he was supposed to do it on his own time so i'm going to read you briefly these clips so the new york state ethics commission voted tuesday to require former governor andrew cuomo to repay the more than five million in compensation he received for a book he wrote in 2020 on his handling of the covid 19 pandemic pandemic the joint commission on public ethics voted 11 to 2 on a resolution requiring cuomo to repay within 30 days all the compensation he earned from sales of his 2020 book american crisis leadership lessons from the covid 19 pandemic cuomo who resigned in august over sexual harassment allegations has been criticized for using public resources including state workers to write the book the lucrative book contract increased cuomo's net income more than fivefold to 1.5 million dollars in 2020 from just over two hundred eighty thousand dollars in 2019 according the tax documents. The resolution says such repayment was necessary because Cuomo isn't legally entitled to retain compensation he received from the book's publication because he lacked legal authority to engage in outside activity. The panel voted last month to revoke the approval it had granted Cuomo for the book's publication, arguing he'd violated the conditions of that approval, which included requirements that he write the book on his own personal time without using state resources. Cuomo's attorney Jim McGuire called the decision unconstitutional and said that the ethics board Actions appear to be driven by political interest rather than the facts and the law, McGuire said in a statement. Should they seek to enforce this action, we'll see them in court. Yeah, whatever. Fuck you, Andrew. But all that matters is that he has to pay that money back. Bye, you broke bitch. I love this, okay? I love this reckoning coming for white people because it's overdue. Now, will it go through? I don't know. But so far, I'm encouraged. And then last on our hot tops, we just have something fucking weird. Okay, let me make sure. Okay, it was, um, I saw on Twitter and I just, I just had to share. So it was someone from TikTok and these are just screenshots. It said, when book talk is out here, like I hate the pregnancy trope. It's not my favorite trope, you know, and a lot of other people don't like it. So this person says, and you're an author most known for forced pregnancy. Where the guy do stuff like this what is forced pregnancy is is that different than rape is, is that different okay and then says gives her a fertility shot while she's unconscious and then there's a screenshot in the reply says tampers with her birth control Isn't that right? So, uh, I mean, you know, it is fiction, but Adelaide, I'm not reading it at all. So I just had to share that. Okay, moving on. Back into talking about YA. Now, I'm not sure if I've seen this exact argument, but YA Twitter is always on some bullshit. So anyway, I'm not saying this person is on bullshit. I think this was a legitimate question and then people were taking it all the way fucking left per usual. So the original post says, it seems like everyone I follow, mutuals or not, is losing interest in YA, young adult, 
at the moment. And I cannot tell if it's just I follow people in my age demographic and it's a natural taste progression or if Y is objectively getting worse, maybe both. I do feel like 2016 to 2018 was like a YA golden period where so many new interesting things were coming out, but now it seems very stagnant and repetitive, but genuinely unable to tell if that's just me aging or if it's kind of true. Anyone have thoughts? I went back to YA in 2016 after being into adult because I felt it felt like so much cool stuff was happening in that space, but I feel like we came out the other side of that to me, or maybe that's not true. Um, and so they also added re YA getting objectively worse. I do think some awesome, awesome books are coming out right now. I more meant the overall structure of similar stories rather than actual individual books being bad. Um, I don't think authors are worse or anything. I just think the Y publishing machine, machine took advantage of the boom and we ended up with a lot of similar stuff, kind of like when the dystopian boom. And, you know, of course, people got all up in their feelings. Um, I think Bethany, hey, Bethany, if you're watching, had a great response, probably a combination, but I have been frequently disappointed with Y sequels lately. I think publishing timelines aren't giving authors the frame they need or giving the time they need, especially in a pandemic and the result is underbaked books, but also there are exciting things happening in an adult, especially SFF. And so, like I said, I don't have all of the tweets because honestly, I was like, I don't have time. Like my bookmarks are freaking full and I do not want to play, pay Twitter $2.99 just so I can get bookmark folders. It's ridiculous. I love Twitter, but that's shady. Okay, y'all have enough money. Anyway, um, so of course, so many people took this as like, not this person saying YA is terrible when all these different uh, diverse authors are getting published. They didn't say that. They didn't say that. I think there's also a tweet somewhere saying like, I don't know, they, they created like a diverse book club or something. Basically, that's not what they're saying. And I feel like, obviously, I have aged out of I've been out of the age uh, parameters for young adult books, but I still find some occasionally that I enjoy. However, I will say 2016 to 2018, I definitely was reading more of them and enjoying more of them than I am now. And I think it can be a combination of age. And the books, I do think that they're just being like, I know there's a, a lag in time before between someone like signing and a book releasing. So like maybe they signed a bunch of people at once, all these books are coming out. And that's not to say all of the books, especially if there's so many by non-white authors coming out, non-straight authors coming out, that they're all inherently terrible. But I do think a lot of them have great promise or great premise and maybe they're not given enough time and like editing and developing the story or a lot of them are similar stories. So yeah. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I swear why Twitter has something to say every other day. But it was just an interesting, interesting conversation started. And I really liked Bethany's response. I really do think it's more so on the side of the publishing industry and not the authors themselves. Because there's so many cool premises and even some I've read or heard other people read. And they just don't seem like they get enough time, especially more like mid list books. But even some of the ones they push a lot, it's like y'all are spending a lot of time marketing this book. The covers are beautiful, getting blurbs, but like, are y'all not spending time with like the writing development? I'm not a writer because writing is hard. So like, someone has a great story. I don't know how much of a story you have to have written before you get signed. I don't know any of that. But let's say this person has this story, they have like a first draft, they're interested, they get signed. But like, I feel like they're not going through enough of like edits and like, hmm, maybe you can develop this story a little bit more here. Maybe you can develop this character a little bit more here. They're really doing like exterior work to get it to sell. But like, I want to buy the book and love the book. I want a beautiful cover and beautiful inside. And sometimes I don't feel like those always line up. So yeah. I think two things can be true, that publishing is pushing out too much and not giving enough time to the books, and that we're aging out of enjoying a lot of young adult stories, but still, because there's still middle grade stories that I love as an old ass person. So I'm gonna blame publishing more on this one than me. But anyway, that was a few, a couple days on Twitter, <laughs> right at the end, December 29th. Wow, going into the new year, I was like, oh my God, duh get it together and then back on the other thing I don't think I have a screenshot over here because there's multiple but the worst of list oh my god I'm so sick every year of course because everyone does their end of year videos which is 
my favorite time of the year. So people do best of, most surprising, most disappointing, worst of, their top 10, top 20, whatever. All those end of year videos that everyone has been doing is doing through January. And of course, here come the little crotchety bitches being like, you know what? Oh wait, I feel like I have a tweet somewhere. So here's my worst books list for the year. Worst book list. Fuck you. Sadie, please, okay? It's just like, if you don't like them, don't watch them. Especially as an author, I wouldn't watch them. Now, I think Zoraida Cordova had a tweet that said something like, it's really disheartening or like feels weird to watch an author make a disappointing uh, worst books list of the year. I don't know who she was referring to. I was like, girl, tell me who it is. Um, and there was different discourse on that. Um, but this always happens. And then there was someone else who was like, if you don't like a book, don't write a review. Don't tweet about it. Don't make a video about it. What? Are you out of your fucking mind? Sometimes people find books they love from books other people hated. I've done that. I'm like, oh, you hate these tropes? I love these things. And it's happened for people under my video. And I'm happy for you. I make a video ranting about a book I don't like. And one, it's cathartic and fun and then I love getting people's responses like I loved this book but your your take was funny or hmm, I didn't read this book but what you hated I might like it's literally not a big deal unless the person who makes a list or video or Instagram post unless they tag the author or like send it to an author that is when it's not okay but someone just going through and ranking the books they read in the year so are you then I feel like in that same vein if you have a best of list, you shouldn't post that either because that means that every book you read didn't make it on your best of list. So isn't that wrong too? Like cry me a fucking river and get over it. It's ridiculous, but it happens every year. This happened last year. At least this year, they're not um, ganging up on Gavin because we would have to fight some hoes. But it's just, it's absurd. And I don't know if people like schedule these tweets. Like they're like, oh, it's almost the end of the year in November and they type out this tweet so it can be tweeted in December. But like, fuck y'all, okay? You don't like it, don't watch it. But please do not tag, do not send authors negative review. Actually, I feel like unless it's a five star glowing review, you shouldn't tag author, not even a four, no, no. And now on Instagram, apparently if you tag an author in a post they get like a dm or something or if you tag a person i don't know what the hell's going on over there but anyway do not send any kind of critique to an author unless you're like five million stars is the best thing i read tag the author or if you just say you loved it like sometimes i'll read a book and be like oh i loved it da, 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 and tag the author but i don't tell them the rating and on goodreads maybe i gave it a four but i'm not gonna tell them that i i don't know there's something wrong with a lot of people. There's something wrong with people who tag authors in negative reviews and there's also something wrong with people who are like, a oh, worst book list is so negative. I would just never do that. Great for you. But we's gonna do it and I'm gonna watch it. So mind your business. But that was it on my cyclical uh, portion of this video. Unless I miss something, which is possible because sometimes I just be muting people and I can't take it anymore. So moving on onto our final section. So we all know the Hugo Awards, very important awards in the sci-fi fantasy world for adult authors. And uh, they happened at the end of December. And then S.A. Chakraborty or Shannon, who wrote the David Bod trilogy, which I love, tweeted something very troubling about the Hugo Awards. So she said, I know Twitter is where nuance goes to die, but it is both possible to say this weekend's Hugo Awards were a great night for marginalized creators, many of whom knew nothing about its sponsorship and that Raytheon should have had absolutely nothing to do with them. I'm probably going to regret tweeting this. I know people, many of whom I respect, worked incredibly hard to put Discon and the Hugos together. I know it's changed hands and the process was chaotic. I didn't even know it had sponsors, but Raytheon, let's talk about them. They are one of the largest military defense contractors in the world. They actively interfered and pushed to continue the absolute brutal war in Yemen. 
Their weapons and systems are directly linked to the death of scores of innocent people. I'm sitting here typing and deleting tweets, wondering which tabbed article referencing the gruesome deaths of children will be enough to keep all the tech companies have had some bad history replies from coming. coming and honestly, I don't know what to say. I don't know who approved this. I don't know how extensive Raytheon's involvement was. It would be helpful if Discon would reply to some of the messages being sent. The majority of attendees I know basically found out during the ceremony and did a what the fuck just happened. I have no doubt people would have pushed back if this was public knowledge during a time that arrangements could have been changed or frankly made different decisions if the sponsorship remained. At least I hope so because damn, some of the convos I've seen are disheartening. I don't know what else to say. Elements of the American SFF field have always had a fucked up relationship with the military industrial complex, but really Raytheon? Still typing and deleting tweets, but I will say this. Publishing has thrown a lot of what the fuck moments my way, but make sure one of the most prestigious awards in my industry isn't being sponsored by a war criminal before accepting the nomination. This shouldn't have happened. What? It is... I was trying to look up, I didn't see if there was any response or anything from Discon, but I'm like, what? obviously she has linked to an article about Raytheon and then, you know what, I'm gonna type out right here, Discon response to Raytheon sponsorship. Y'all seeing me Google it in real time. Shh, I can't spell. Ooh, let's see, what's this? Open link. Okay, maybe I was looking for, uh, the Hugos separately, they're a part of Discon was like, I guess the convention. So, ooh, this is why we always look up stuff. When was this put out? Signed Mary Robinette. Ooh, I know that name. I don't see a date on this, but I'm assuming this is for. So this is this was the 79th World Science Fiction Convention. That was December 15th through 19th. So Statement on Discon 3 sponsorship. I am Mary Robinette Cole and I was the chair for Discon 3. I take full responsibility for accepting Raytheon Intelligence and Space as a sponsor and I apologize for doing so. The decision tree that led us to this point is filled with branches that sound like excuses for my own culpability. At the root of it is simply that in accepting funding from Raytheon Intelligence and Space and partnering with them for the members red carpet event, I was wrong. That choice has caused harm and damage to people. The finalists who were unaware, the people in our communities, the members and staff of Worldcon who trusted me to make good choices. I am sorry that I let you all down. Discon 3 is making an anonymous contribution to an organization dedicated to peace equal to the amount we received from Raytheon. I am also personally contributing to the same organization. The delay in responding added to the distress that we caused. For this, I ask your forgiveness. We needed to have conversations that were slowed by post-convention travel. For the past over days, we have read your comments in email and in social media. Thank you for sharing them with us and trusting that you would be heard and taken seriously. Your honesty and sincerity are what make our community are what make our community a better place. Future con runners can avoid our mistakes by developing a sponsorship policy for your organization that reflects the values and concerns of our community, creating a robust plan for doing due diligence on potential sponsors, creating a mission and value statement against which to measure actions. We did none of those. Our code of conduct says that Discon 3 aims to build an inclusive community for all fans. This sponsorship did not achieve that goal. I cannot erase the harm that my actions caused. This happened on my watch. It is my fault and I am deeply sorry for the pain I caused. I mean, they acknowledged it and I guess like, I guess you need money to do everything, right? Like I don't always think of that. So they obviously need money to put on this event and they accepted that money from this company. And maybe straight off, they just thought like intelligence and space and they're like SFF sounds great, makes sense as a partnership and maybe didn't look into it, you know, to be fair. Right off the bat, I didn't know what Raytheon was, so maybe they just went with it, saw, you know, space and intelligence and like, sounds cool. But also, when you're in charge of something that's, you know, this important, this big, you kind of need to do a quick Google on these companies. So at least when I saw Shannon's tweets, a lot of other authors were tweeting about it as well and hadn't heard anything back. So at least now there's a, um, she did make a statement on behalf of the convention and hopefully that won't happen again in the future because yikes but yeah mm. Mm. actually I would love to know your opinion what do you think do you think that was wrong of them to have it sponsored by them or you don't think it's a big deal y'all know I want y'all I know you're gonna give me your thoughts but just to make sure I want to know please let me know okay so moving on here
Excuse me, I need to get on my phone. Wow. So, Ruby Dixon, who has written uh, The Ice Planet Barbarians and uh, plenty of other books, but Ice Planet Barbarians took TikTok by storm last year and, and really blew up. I think those are independently published books that are um, speculative romance featuring hot blue men that I'm going to read this year. There was a post and it was a apparently that her books all got pulled down from Amazon like with no notice no and no reason why and she has a lot of books and you know a lot of them have sexy times in it. I think most have sexy times in them so um this was shared on Twitter and of course there was a lot of like outcry and like what can we do and and, and whatever when this happened not whatever but just a lot of things right so i did go on her facebook and now her books are back up so her latest post was just a quick update i spoke with amazon and it was definitely an error that my account was taken down they were absolutely lovely about it and very apologetic we're still working on restoring a few things so please give me a few days to get paperbacks back up in addition the pre-order for dark fire might be footsed and I might have to create a new one. So we scooted the date out and I might have to cancel the old and make a new. I'll keep y'all posted. In the meantime, I hope you all have cake because Lord knows I have stress eating all of mine, LOL. So really great that this happened. I think really great that her books are back up and I cannot remember, but I feel like this happened in a previous community video with authors or like a press. Maybe a small press got all their books taken down, but they had enough of a following and enough people like contacted Amazon and everything that they got their books back up. But conversations that were happening on Twitter was everyone always doesn't have that much support. Ruby Dixon has been writing for a long time. She has a lot of fans, other authors that know her work, a lot of people who can, you know, like go to bat on her behalf, contact Amazon on her behalf. All indie authors do not have that. And like what's going on when these random things with sometimes apparently it's like their their bots or whatever that are maintaining the websites just see something and like decide to take it down and what happens when you don't you don't have really that power and it's just you trying to find to get your stuff back up so this is not the first time it's happened and it's just like why is this continuously happening and i don't know the reason so i did see a tweet by uh nova yes that said why are authors getting banned from amazon because of sesta slash fosta which are two acts that were passed during the orange cheetos time in office so they said any books including sex sex work or information about sex or sexuality can be targeted by sesta fosta as they are filed as pornographic material according to the laws smut is porn period um, there are supposedly anti-trafficking laws that in reality affect and target any kind of sexual activity or speech online. Ultimately, it limits Section 230 speech laws and the First Amendment. And so it has affected a lot of people, sex workers, queer people, human rights activists, massage therapists, sexual health educators, digital libraries, authors, historians, artists, visual aid works, fanfic libraries, trauma discussion forums. So I was looking this up because I like heard of those acronyms but didn't know much about it. But of course... I am not gonna go down this this road here because it, it mm, it's a long road but if you know anything about like right-wing people and you talk about any kind of human rights their thing is like how do you care about any of this but you're not thinking about all the children that are being and i do not say this because i do not believe does not happen because it does but that's like their end all be all that's the only thing that's happening in this country and y'all aren't paying attention to it it's very that's like their one singular focus so this i mean i don't want to scroll back up but i had to see it so you had to see it look at this anyway so this was written in in July 2018. So this article, I'll link of course down below, it goes through all of the things like what it's intended to do, what it's actually doing, who it's hurting. So I was down here, where is it? Now see, I sent a scroll back up. Who are these people? So whatever, I don't wanna see the people. Okay, what it actually does. And so if you're old like me, you know that Craigslist used to have like personal ads on it where people could like meet each other. There's also there was also something called like Backpage where people would like meet up with people, you know, for um, adult activities and such. And so their whole thing is like all of these any websites like this that allow people to meet people and hook up that are not really regulated or not like Tinder or something um, are places where people get trafficked and not to say that they aren't. And so these laws 
were created to kind of protect, protect that, but they started out more narrow and then kind of spread in their scope and really target a lot of just sexual things that have sexual content on the internet. I remember a few months ago when something was happening with OnlyFans because a lot of sex workers are on OnlyFans and it was something with banks, like not, I forgot exactly what it was, but I'm sure some of you remember. But so this act is saying that it um, really, cause it's about, it's not like people behind the screen, right? It's like some computer system or whatever that might just find something and target that and say, oh, this is like trafficking and pull it down. And so that could apply to books that include sexual content, obviously, um, or, you know, erotica, romance books. So there's no proof that exactly what happened to Ruby Dixon. Um, but it could be because it's not the first person that has happened to and these laws have affected other things on the internet. Um, so like this says, instead of directly targeting websites known to facili facilitate sex trafficking, the FOSTA says to hybrid essentially sets up a template for broad based censorship across the web. This means websites will have to decide whether to over police their platforms for potential prostitution advertisement or to under police them so they can maintain a know nothing stance, which would likely be a very tricky claim to prove in court. And um, so obviously it sounds more like, you know, like dating websites and stuff, but apparently it it goes into more of that. And again, if it's like by a computer system and algorithm. Um, yeah, I don't know. This says websites are pressured into deleting content, whether or not it has anything to do with sex work. So again, I don't know how much directly this um, has to do with what happened with Ruby Dixon's books. But I mean, in general, I think it's uh, a law that definitely is probably going too far. And I don't know how well it's actually working to do what it was designed to do. This article is really long. So I would highly recommend you read it. I haven't read the whole thing yet. But I do want to go. Uh, I do want to go through the entire thing. Luckily, Ruby Dixon got her books back up. So that's what's important. And <sighs> it's just worrisome like the internet modern day technology like provides a lot of you know uh i don't know more freedom and more it's not a level playing field but obviously with like the internet and self-publishing it gives more people an opportunity to get into publishing but then also if something like this can happen really quickly without any kind of reason it's kind of troublesome so i don't know I don't know. But I'm parched. I have one more thing on my list to go over here. I did have another thing, but I'm going to do a separate little video on it. So if you if it's the thing and you're like, why isn't it in here? It's going to have a separate video. Um, and so my last thing is about <sighs> this messy lady. And someone sent me this on Twitter a while ago. I'm so sorry. I just got to your message. And so there's an author named Alexandra Sokoloff, and she basically is blaming another author who has a YouTube channel and gives out like advice about writing and um, like, you know, structuring your writing and stuff like that. Basically saying that this author was stealing her ideas, but the ideas are like basic writing concepts, but she just like talks. Like, let me let me explain this to you. So this started at the end of November. So her name is Sarah, the author and YouTuber that Alexandra is is claiming is taking her stuff. So I'll have Sarah did a video. I'll link it down below. So Alexandra, November 28th said, I've asked you repeatedly to stop using and distributing material that your own that your own quotes from your own videos and blogs make clear you got from my copyrighted screenwriting tricks for authors books and workshops. You're still using and distributing that material and what I believe are thousands of instances without crediting me. You've blocked me from commenting on your YouTube channel, blog and Instagram where you continue to distribute as your own for your own profit the work I've spent decades developing. You told your followers to ignore anything I've said and not engage in the negativity as if my asking you to stop using material stop using material for your videos and blogs make clear you got from my copyrighted material without permission or attribution is negativity 
But as long as you keep distributing material I've put my whole experience and life into without permission or credit to me, I'm going to keep calling attention to what you're doing and calling on you to stop. And there's a much larger writing community that's going to be intensely interested in the moral issues here and a much larger audience of passionate writers, authors, screenwriters, and writers as organizations who will have a lot to say about what you claim you have the right to when the copyrighted material from another author's books. Is this really what you want to be known for? Let me take a screenshot of this mess so I can put it in the put it in the video. It's really a mess. And then let's see. I mean, she keeps she has really long posts like here i'm not gonna read the next one but anyway essentially she's saying that sarah is talking about things that are in that are copywritten like like she has claimed to so courtney milan our resident twitter lawyer i mean there's plenty but also a romance writer tweeted some things saying just re-upping re my generic advice that you should not sue someone for copyright infringement unless you can get someone who specializes in copyright to say that you definitely have a clear claim and the person you are suing has assets to make it worthwhile. Losing a copyright suit could easily cost you six figures to litigate and you will then pay the person you lost to six figures under the attorney fee shifting provision. This is especially true if you claim someone is copying your ideas. Ideas are not protected by copyright. Please, I am begging you, sometimes what you need to spend your money on is a bottle of wine, not a lawyer. You can buy so much wine with six figures. <laughs> this is what, this is what Alexandra Sokoloff is saying is her copywritten material. Use of the three act structure. Even I know you can't copyright that. Suggesting people buy a notebook to record their ideas. Uh, using color coded index cards for plotting. Discussion of making lists. Uh, using Harry Potter as an example of a hero's wound. Using the word pantsers to describe writers who don't plot. <laughs> Are you gonna sue NaNoWriMo? Use of the term the black moment and the use of collages. Those are the things that she said that this person stole from her. And Courtney Milan said none of this stuff is copyrightable. And also lol at thinking you could own this. The three act structure? What? <laughs> what? It just... Um... So Courtney said she watched the video and she's going to expand on her generic advice. If your lawyer has advised you that you do not have a copyright suit, you should not then tell everyone that you do have a copyright suit and suggesting that people interfere with that person's business. This is defamation and probably given the context defamation per, defamation per se. It is also not suing over this, but do not try to subject yourself to lawsuits. Possibly you should talk to your lawyer before accusing someone online of gauging in improper business conduct. When your lawyer has sent correspondences to that person's lawyer agreeing that this conduct, conduct was not improper. Using index cards? And she got along at, this is one of her other Facebook posts and I'm like, sister girl, I'm not reading all this right now, ma'am. Oh my God, it keeps going. Oh, oh my God. That was one post. Uh, it seems like she loves to end her post with, is this what you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for this messiness? Um, and so this was, like I said, at the end of November, beginning of December. So I didn't know if they had resolved anything. I didn't. I went to Sarah's YouTube. She hadn't. She posted that one video talking about it. She hasn't addressed it since then. Um, and she, I guess, has made multiple, you know, Facebook posts or whatever. But the most recent one they found was dun, 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 December 19th. So I will read this one, the latest. Sarah Cannon heart breathings. This is about the last thing I want to be doing this time of year, but you're the one who posted that slam video. So here we are. <laughs> there is so much false in that video. It's hard to know where to start, but I'll hit some of the main points. You claim that the matter of you using and distributing work that you use to admit in your own videos that you got from my copyrighted screenwriting tricks for authors book has been legally settled and my claims were deemed meritless. Legally settled? How exactly? Deemed meritless? By whom, Sarah? 
Only a court can determine the merits of this case and we haven't been anywhere near court yet. So who decided my claims are meritless and the case has been legally settled and I have no legal recourse? You? That's not the way a lawsuit works. Do you not know that? Or are you trying to pretend otherwise to your followers? Number two. Are you really trying to tell your followers that I claim to have exclusive right to teach the three act structure? That is false and absurd. By your own admission, you've taken my workshop several times and my screenwriting tricks for authors is one of your favorite books. So you must know I always start my workshops by tracing the beginning of the three act structure to the golden age of Greek theater and Aristotle's poetics. I write the same in, any, in early chapters of each of the books. I don't claim any exclusive right to teach it. I never have. It is false and ridiculous to say that I ever claim that. So again, are you really trying to tell your followers that's what I've claimed? Well, I mean, I hope she didn't. Number three, I have not claimed any exclusive right to the word pantser or to talk about Harry Potter's wound. That is so false and ridiculous. I can't believe anyone will buy it for a second. Are you really trying to tell your followers that's what I've claimed? Number four, and are you claiming that somehow you don't know one of my main specific contentions that you are using and distribu distributing one of the core teachings of all my books and workshops, the master list method that I detail throughout all the books and that you are doing it without permission and without attribution. You never ask permission to make your videos and blogs and workbooks about that and other methods from my books, but you at least used to admit that you got it from my screenwriting tricks for authors and that is the best way to get stories ideas and inspiration and I changed your life. Have you somehow forgotten that I have repeatedly specifically objected to you now distributing this method you got from my copyrighted material to thousands of people as a lead magnet booklet to build your business with no credit whatsoever to me? Why didn't you mention any of that if you have nothing to hide? Number five, do you not know that your lawyer is claiming you have the right to use? Use that and any method for my books any way you like. Unlike you, I will provide a direct quote. <clears throat> oh my god my battery's gonna die brb okay my camera is like girl the dramatics are too strong okay so the quote is since miss sokolov has no patent anyone can use the method teach it discuss it earn money from it etc accordingly miss cannon has no need to ask miss sokolov for permission to distribute or otherwise use the master list method even if Miss Cannon happens to have first learned master list method from Miss Sokoloff, that does not mean that Miss Sokoloff owns any legal rights in it or that Miss Cannon needs Miss Sokoloff's permission to use such a method. Just from that quote, it's clear that your lawyer knows this is not a debate about the three act structure or the word pantser or Harry Potter's wound. So why didn't you mention that what you and your lawyer are really claiming that you have the right to use specific work like the master list for my copyrighted books any way you like and make money from it? Okay, pause, but didn't, didn't this just say that you don't need any kind of, it says, since Ms. Sokolov has no patent, anyone can use the method to teach it, discuss and earn money from it. But she said, so why don't you mention what you're really claiming that you have the right to use specific work, like the master list from my books, any way you like and make money from it. Literally, that's what the lawyer just said. You can. I'm confused. I'm really confused. If you really think that you have the right to do that with the painstakingly developed work of your mentor, that you have the right to and will use anything in my copyrighted books any way you want, why should any writer work with you? Why should any writer you work with think that you won't do the same to them and the work of their heart? Why should any author or any writer you work with think that you won't take anything from their books that you think you can use for your own profit? But maybe you're not reading about what but maybe you're not reading what your lawyer is saying for you because what kind of author, let alone a writing, teaching, writing mentor, writing coach would try to make the claim about the work another author has developed over decades? Now that you're aware of the shocking number of false statements you made in that video, I'm sure you'll correct them for your followers because you say you're interested in the truth and because writers aren't stupid. People will see and are seeing the inconsistencies. I am asking you publicly, author to author, and will keep asking that you stop using and distributing without permission or attribution work that you use to admit in your videos and blogs you got from my copyrighted screenwriting books for authors hoping for a peaceful resolution to this in the new year. I again don't understand, like, but it's not illegal. Oh, there are comments. Anyway, of course people were coming for her and attacking her, people who were fans of Alexandra Sokoloff. And honestly, I mean, obviously I'm not a writer. It sounds like a big mess to me. And um, I feel like 
I don't watch AuthorTube because I'm not an author, but I feel like those ideas that probably a lot of people talk about. Like maybe were they friends at one point? I don't know. It's a mess. It's honestly a mess. And I haven't seen, I, I looked at Sarah's Twitter and obviously I told you YouTube, she hasn't said anything. So I don't know if she saw this, um, you know, maybe didn't want to deal with it during the holidays, which makes sense. I don't know what's going to go on. Obviously there's no legal merit to this. So I don't know what Alexandra Sokoloff wants from her besides to stop using her methods from her books but i'm like girl because and, and she keeps so she she proved that that stuff is not you can't own it but then also keeps saying my copyrighted methods from my book what are you what are you doing here i don't know I don't know. It's a mess. If anyone has any more insight into it, I mean, I guess I could read through the comments, but all these people who are Alexandra fans, I've been talking for a while, covered a lot of things. As always, please give me your thoughts, comments, additional information maybe I missed in the comments down below. I will link all of these things that I have up on my screen um, so that you can read them. And then again, if there was a thing you wanted hear about it's not here it's gonna be a separate video because i was starting to talk about it and then it was too long so the year did not end on a, a boring note that's for damn sure and i'm sure this year will keep us entertained um is it bad that i'm kind of hoping that someone tries for nora roberts again so that she can read them to filth and i can get a good cackle out of it like i really want some more really ridiculous petty drama this year that I can get a good cackle out of because I have personally explained the process to you Deborah was like one of the highlights of my book community life thus far and I, I really would like one of those moments some of these other things are way more serious um but like I said I'll keep you up to date with anything if there's any more with like Purdue Pharma um and the trial that's uh going on between the DOJ and uh blocking penguin random house simon and schuster so lots of info leave me your thoughts if you haven't already give this video a like subscribe but thank you again to surfshark for sponsoring this video as always my code is owens o-w-e-n-s and you get 83 percent off and three months free i've got a link down below for you to check out but anyway i hope your year is off to a decent start at least a good start great start i hope it's off to a great start um I cannot believe it's 2022. Thank you for watching this video. I know I've been blabbering on for a while. Anyway, stay blessed, hydrated, moisturized, and sunscreened. Yes, even in the winter. Put on your sunscreen. Oh my God. I did start a TikTok. Do you want to follow me there? I'm not, it's not about books. My, my thing is I'm going to try to pursue to be a skin TikToker. Mm, skincare, not skin. That's weird. Skincare. So if you want to see like, skincare stuff that I like to use, don't like, sunscreen that I like and don't like and stuff, that's where I will be posting that content. Also, hold up, I know I'm rambling, but 30K, what the fuck? How did we get here? Holy shit, y'all. Thank you. I, thank you. I mean, I don't know what else to say, but I, y'all are amazing. Thank you so much. So anyway, I will see you in my next one. Bye.